everybody, and welcome to tonight's We'll Talk with Artists. Uh, my name is Martha Campbell, and I'm MFA's Communications Manager. Our digital dis discussion tonight is with renowned painter Abigail McBride. Abigail was raised in the art world and has devoted her life to crafting visions of the world she sees, mostly in oil and charcoal. Her work combines classic subjects and modern tone and designs, developing work that asks viewers to dive deeper into the color and construction around them. I would also like to introduce the host of our show, Will Scott. Will is an art historian with an extensive career as a photographer and the former head of adult programs for the National Gallery of Art. He is uniquely qualified to help bridge the gap between artists and the public, and he will be our art—he will be our guide as the art world tonight. It's been a minute since I had to read this, so you know, welcome back, everybody. By the way, <laughs> thank you, Martha, um, and uh, also thank you very much to Abigail for agreeing to do this. Uh, many of you probably do know Abigail or uh, and or her work, and I think it's quite strong and quite interesting, particularly as I'm a historian of, uh, of American art. And we may talk a little bit more about art history than sometimes in the past, but I wanna try and stick to 30 minutes also. So before I say anything else, I wanna also thank Martha. It has been a while since we've been together and Martha is always prepared and keeps us moving along. So it's good to see so many familiar faces and some new ones too. Um, Abigail, before we begin, I want to uh, just say a couple of things. And if you want to react, that would be great. Okay. One is that I find your uh, handling of pigment very strong. And I'm not going to get down into, you know, all of this stuff about whether there's a brush stroke that reveals the artist's character or even gender. But I do want to comment on that. It's a very uh, confident and strong brush stroke, which I think is a hallmark and a strong point uh, in every sense of your work. The other thing I want to say is that as a student of the history of American art, primarily painting, um, there is so much about your art that I think is very traditional. But I mean that in the best sense. You seem to have a familiarity with the tradition of American painting and then have uh, dealt with that tradition in your own distinct and personal way. Mm. What do you think about those comments? Well, when you talk about like the, the mark, you first you said pigment and then you said mark. So are you referring to the color? Or are you referring to the way the paint is Both. applied? Both, you have- Both. yeah. You, your, your color is often subdued in its hue, but it's still strong mm. and intense. And your brush stroke is, I started graduate school a very long time ago. Uh, and people would still talk about, you know, they would comment on a female artist as, well, that's a very masculine and strong uh, brush stroke. You know, I don't want to go there because I don't think that's relevant what is more relevant is why do you paint that way? Mm. Well, I think uh, certainly coming from um, a color, uh, very color oriented background where there's a lot of many years of really digging trenches in order to perceive color for itself relationally, like the way, same way that, um, academics look at value and they really dig deep to see value relationships and organize value relationships. I did that with color for a long, long time with a lot of rigid discipline. And so it did give me a feeling of freedom with color as something that I can play like music. And so it's all of that the many years that I spent engaging helped me to know color is in isolation, just like when you play a song, no note is in isolation. It has to fit within the whole. And the more you see how it fits within the whole, the more fluidity you can have with your play and the more um, expressive you can become without breaking out of the language. And so, but then the same has uh, more recently come about with my mark making, which is something that I've become much more intentional with. In the beginning, I just was putting the paint down just to get it down and didn't think about the shape or size of the stroke or the transparency of the paint. 
Now I'm very concerned with maintaining certain areas of um, thin, transparent paint and allowing it to build like a bas relief, you know, for some of the more opaque areas and to really tap fully into everything that the paint can do. And I've slowed way down with painting, trying to make sure that rather than being in a frenzy of putting things down, like a gestural frenzy where you have limited time, I've given myself permission to allow the paintings to happen sometimes over the course of years and letting each mark be full of intent. And everything that everything that you're saying, Abigail, actually is sort of falling into line with some of the things I was thinking about your work as I looked at it on your website. In that, while when you look at the images and the subjects that you've chosen, uh, they seem very traditional. Mm -hmm. But the way you were just talking about how you've made decisions about mark making and about color relationships falls right in line with some of the early 20th century abstractionists and their theories about color and yeah. painting. So what is it that has most influenced you? And this would be a time where you, you, know, you can go back to the very beginning and talk about uh, you know, your, your early experiences or your early artistic education. Just, but let's try to be quick because I do wanna emphasize the images as much as we can. I mean, it's, there's a lot to unpack. I mean, I started very young and because I grew up in an art family, my grandmother was a painter. My first lessons were with her on the farm. Um, when I was, I think eight, um, I started very seriously painting with her every summer that we were there. And, um, and Where then I- Where was that? Where was hmm? the farm? Where the was farm the farm? The farm is in Minnesota. Wow, oh, okay. Yeah, very rural Northern Minnesota. Um, and she was a watercolor painter, so I actually started out in watercolor. Um, and then uh, I would say in high school, I found the local art community in Annapolis and uh, discovered a really vibrant community of artists, starting with Bonnie Roth Anderson, um, who all had connections to the Cape School. And uh, ultimately that led me to go up to Cape Cod and the Cape School and I spent four or five summers living at the school in a very rustic environment, you know, outdoor shower. Uh, you could see through the walls to the street. You had to kill all the mosquitoes before you went to bed. It was, um, you know, no heat, no air. It was, but it was amazing because we just did nothing but paint all day. And then all the different people who'd studied with Henry Henchy, who is, um, you know, the last real like legacy painter of that American okay. tradition. Abigail, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. because I'm more conscious uh, about the fact that I haven't allowed a lot of time for the Q and A, mm. I want to. I'm going to be interrupting you more than I've interrupted others, so I apologize. To get okay. That. But when you say that your uh, grandmother was sort of your first teacher in uh, rural Minnesota, uh, when was your grandmother born, and was she trained as an artist? Yeah, she actually um, got a scholarship to go to art school because she, her parents didn't want to pay for her because they had to pay for the brother to go to college in that era. And she was making her living as an illustrator as a single uh, woman, which was unheard of at that time. And uh, until she married my grandfather, who she had had a, a wartime correspondence with. And uh, then, you know, this is the Second in, World War. So you're, you're yeah your grandmother would have begun painting when in the thirties. Yeah, I guess. Like yeah. That. Okay. And she was a watercolorist. So yeah. did she ever tell you that she had any favorite American watercolorists or, or watercolorists in general? I mean, I know, I think she studied with Tom Lynch. Um, and she took workshops from various people in a particular era. Um, she had her own sort of system of going out and doing pencil sketches and yeah. making notations yeah. of the colors. And then she would go back into the studio and go from her notations. Okay. Um, I, I don't want to get too art historical and get down 
in the weeds, which I could easily do, as you can see. Yeah. Uh, but given her era and the fact that she was a watercolorist, of course, by that point, there are strong art schools in Minneapolis and in Chicago, and she probably had some familiarity. Uh, you think she was in Chicago? Um, but you would have to get the rest of my family yeah. in here to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not, we're not going to go. Really so I want to go keep with you and get up to the fact when you started to be uh, connected with the local art scene in Annapolis. And you mentioned Lee Boyton, or you mentioned him on your website. Yeah. Lee's work is, uh, of course, your work is not unlike Lee's in broad uh, characteristics, but he, is, he has a more pastel palette. Mm. And his brushwork is much softer and can sort of disappear depending on the light and color effect he yeah. uh, seems to be after. So is there one of the Annapolis artists that some of us uh, might recognize other than Lee that affected you? Because I don't see a direct relationship there. Oh, I mean, I actually, Bonnie was my first teacher and then Lee Boynton was the next, although I never really studied watercolor with Lee, I studied the figure. Mm -hmm. And then I found John Eversberger and I studied with him for quite a while. And then, uh, Jessica Hoffman introduced me to the Eggly family. And I studied with the Eggly family um, portraiture and figure for quite a while. And uh, a lot of that was overlapping. Yeah. And, um, and then I ended up in Cape Cod studying with, you know, Rob Longley and I got to paint with Hilda Neely. She wasn't necessarily teaching the same way, but I was influenced by all of that and was, um, very rigorous as a student. And then I had an incredible opportunity to go down South and paint with Tommy Thurmond and um, which was a really transformative experience. Also, I would have to give props to like Steve Perkins who taught me sculpture <laughs> and anatomy so that some of my more 3D thinking- Abigail, I, uh, you're extraordinarily well-trained. <laughs> I really went for it with like the yeah. scholarship and um, I'm, I would say a little bit insatiable for um, more knowledge and tools to have in my belt because I feel like it's freedom. It represents freedom. The more I know about illusion language and how to approach things and have all the options at my disposal and I've absorbed them so that they become intuition. Sure. And they can also be. Well, let's start front. looking at how you applied that experience, that training and that intuition. Uh, and uh, Martha, if you could put the first image on the screen. Okay. Abigail, I'm gonna ask you a question before we even dig into this. Are you familiar with the work of William Merritt Chase? Oh yeah, yeah. He's, <laughs> he's of the legacy of yeah. the American Impressionists. Uh, and... Well, I, I reference him in a different way. He's always credited as being an American Impressionist. And in fact he is, but he's not, that, that's, um, if you don't know his work and his period in American art in depth, that's a little superficial and even I, th I feel misleading, but not in your case. I'm not uh, applying mm -hmm. this in any way to you, but I want to look at this image because of, of um, two things. One is that most people think of Georgia O'Keeffe as this great modernist who did all of these Southwestern uh, sort of, you know, the, the skulls in the sky and the images of the sun and uh, of the Abiquiu landscape. But when she was a young woman in her uh, teens, she studied with William Mary Chase in New York, and she painted a beautiful still life of a rabbit. You know, it was a classic studio exercise piece, but her color and her brush stroke, in some ways, I look, looked at this and I thought of that image. That is crazy because you are not the first person to say that to me about Georgia O'Keeffe. In fact, I um, recently have been participating in a museum exhibit out West, the Cheyenne Frontier Days. And the reason I was connected to them was that there was an antique dealer that I used to visit frequently in order to get still life objects. And every time I would stop in over the course of years, I would go, oh, hey, and look, here's the still life. And I did this is, I got this one in your shop and this object I got in your shop. And then all of a sudden one year he goes, you know, your work reminds me a little bit of Georgia O'Keeffe. And I'm connected to a curator out West. 
And I think your work might be good for this show. I'm going to go ahead and ask him to invite you. And I was like, okay, you know, and, and then sure enough, I ended up, and it was, I had never before heard, you're this only, the second person only to make a direct connection to Georgia O'Keeffe. I mean, yeah, I that just proves, Abigail, how uh, strong your work is and what a brilliant art historian I am. <laughs> <laughs> Victory for both of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, what I want to talk about here is this is a good example of what I uh, was saying earlier about I think your brush stroke is strong. Uh, and um, I'm thinking of the green leaves, but really the, the whole surface of the canvas is surprisingly uh, firm. Mm. Uh, some of the American Impressionists and some of the French Impressionists, you, you know, their touch has a delicacy to it. Mm. And I don't see that anywhere in the paintings of yours. And I've not seen a lot of your paintings in the flesh. Mm -hmm. So I am working through this, uh, this sort of scrim of uh, digital projection. But the other thing that I wanted to say is that I noticed when I looked over the work on, on your website, shadows are very, very important to you, it seems. Am I? Well, yeah, correct? I would say that shadows are equally important to light and equally important to form. Uh, in the end, it's all, um, it's all equal. It's all pieces of the puzzle. And if you have one piece missing, then it doesn't, it's not a complete puzzle. And so I'm very keen on shadows and, um, but I'm also leery of like, I went through a phase where I was trying to render the form and then I would connect the form shadow and the cast shadow as a unit and try to model those as a unit. But now I've moved around into trying to perceive the spaces between the objects as walls, you know, of a tunnel. So you would like, as you pass between objects, you're going through a tunnel that's created by the objects. And so that I can render that rather than being object oriented where I render the object and then fill in the background. So I'm very intentionally avoiding the render the object, fill in the background, which is where I think most people start trying to, and I feel like it's the role of the artist in culture to see the world and to see things from another view and to try to show people uh, their world in a new way. And so I'm always looking for that deeper way or a sideways way of seeing things so that I can tap into the magic. The term you use on your website that I think is, uh, you've described what you're referring to, but I want to be sure that I'm understanding both what you say and do uh, uh, fairly. Um, uh, you refer to a visual diary. Every one of your paintings mm -hmm. is kind of like a visual diary. Yeah. And Impressionism is, is in fact in its origin an attempt to, uh, on one level, document. Mm -hmm. uh, what the artists saw, but honestly, in the way they actually saw it, a diary is not a document, I don't think. So what did you mean? And, it, and if you question me, I see you cock your head, which is not unexpected, the things <laughs> that I say. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I think of a diary as a document when I write in a diary. That's what, All that's right, well, let's, intent, let's go there because that's what I'm getting at. Uh, and I'm glad you responded that way. To me, a diary is an individual's uh, uh, record mm. of what they saw and felt or experienced in a given time frame. It might be daily, it might be weekly, or whatever they decide. Yeah. Uh, and because it's filtered through a, a personal uh, individual sensibility, it's not a document in the sense that I, as a historian, think of a document. It's a, mm. it's a generic kind of document because you wrote it down on paper or now electronically yeah. and somebody else can look at it. So that is generically a document. But to me, a document is essentially a fact, you know, like a oh, okay. wedding certificate. Oh, okay. Okay. So that kind of document. Okay. Yeah. So I, what um, did you really mean when you said a visual document? Can you kind of... When I say a visual diary, it's, I would say that my work has become a balancing act between um, highly technical scholarly pursuits in optical understandings of light and form, right? And how as humans, we perceive light and form and you know, 
how to grapple with the passing of time and the adjustment of the iris and you know all these things and then on the other side drilling in a more personal sense drilling down to what really specifically am i interested and in what role do i want my work to play and in the end i feel like anytime you get someone who's a plein air painter who's a perceptual painter you become an accidental genre painter because the things that you put your interest into represent the day the current day yeah. and so i put my attention on the landscape and i am automatically painting the landscape of our era and showing the beauty and aesthetics of our era but in a more personal sense i've started to in an attempt to make my work more meaningful i've started okay. to intentionally put highly personal narratives into the work and have and i don't necessarily feel like there's a need for that narrative to be explicit like like a telling the story but i use the personal narrative to help guide the process of the painting and to guide the composition so that it has a richer meaning and i found when i started doing that and putting that highly personalized meaning into things the paintings did have more depth more secret mystery they had they felt less mechanical and seemed a little bit more genuine and so when i paint i'm a very reactive painter i i paint according to the things that i see i paint the experiences that i have and i'm trying to be faithful to it while at the same time orchestrating the experience that i'm having and infusing it with as much meaning as possible like in this painting this was started in um 2020 right near the beginnings of the lockdowns this little um bottle that has it's a gold leaf it's a little tiny bottle that's off to the side yeah. that is gold leaf that was from my grandmother's studio that she used to touch up paintings and um i often will put uh this object and other objects from her into my work as um you know to honor her and then the plant in there and i very often am using plants in my narratives i'm fascinated by their resilience and uh how quickly and easily they represent life and death and so that plant grew and died back and grew again and then this other little uh orange pot had a succulent in it that i killed in the process of making this painting it died completely and that's why it's called light and life i almost called it life and death you know <laughs> because it was like the a whole epic you know life and death yeah of yeah. the lockdowns was well, happening but then i I'm, worked on the painting for about a year and so the plant grew and died and the painting grew with it so i have versions of this painting with a plant was much bigger before I cut it back. Well, Abigail, I want to say that I think that there, uh, the way that you've just been talking about this work and your work in general, um, I felt that this was uh, a, a very distinctive still life image because I felt there was kind of a, a tension or a presence and mm -hmm. more conventional still lives, as you said earlier, are sort of you depict the object and you try to get the object right. And yeah. then you worry about what else is going on, but there's, these spaces seem to have uh, some kind of force uh, spaces between the different objects. Yeah. So that when you describe the tunnel, I thought that was very um, a good uh, comparison or metaphor of what you're trying to do. But let me jump ahead because we are, I know I'm enjoying the conversation. I hope everybody else is. Uh, we are already at 525. Martha, can you jump ahead to the uh, portrait of Tommy? Okay, thank you. I, those two images, they're beautiful images, but I, I could do a whole art historical riff on them. And if we talked about them as long as we just did about the first one, Abigail, I know, right? <laughs> we'd be done with our hour. Um, so you do still life and we, we've got to look at a landscape before we uh, wrap up and uh, take questions, but you do still life, you do landscape, you do portraiture. Uh, you know, these are the, the basics of traditional Western art. Uh, 
and mm -hmm. and a lot of uh, Asian art as well. I mean, it's it's a pretty universal human thing to want to look at other people, look at the beauties of nature, uh, still life, war, landscape, et cetera, et cetera. So, how do you your especially your charcoal drawings uh, are very uh, compelling. So. Uh, is there any intentionality to the fact that you've stuck close to these kind of basic traditional subjects of Western art? Um, I mean, I've always loved the figure. I thought that I would be a figure portrait painter exclusively when I first started and then got really caught up in the uh, enjoyment of, you know, studying color relationships and then started painting landscape just so that it could be a backdrop to my portraits. But then I started selling the landscapes off the easel and it was actually my- <laughs> That's nice. It, it, I know it was amazing. And so it really helped me to launch a career right away to uh, do these a la prima uh, landscape paintings. And then I found it unwieldy to get models. It was expensive to get models, oh, yeah. you know, portrait commissions were especially in the beginning, were very stressful um, until I now, you know, can exert a little bit more vision over a portrait. Because I, in the beginning, portraiture felt like um, it was all about just pleasing another person and that I was not a component in yeah. it. But you, now you know that what I have my said, approach. Hmm? You know what John Singer Sargent said about portraits? Oh yeah, the mouth? Uh, about portraits, he said, say that again. So you're talking about the mouth quote, like yes, yeah, the, yeah. A portrait <laughs> is a painting about which there's always something wrong with the mouth. There's a little, yeah, there's uh, something uh, wrong yeah, with the mouth. Yeah, that your description was much more personal and immediate. But I think that's <laughs> it's what he was so real. At, but you know? now I feel now this was an exercise in color painting. This particular image, and what it just so happened to be. What do you mean an exercise in color painting? Hmm? What, what do you mean by saying an exercise in color painting? Oh, color painting. Yeah, color painting, where I was painting just um, facets of color so that the form is turned. It's like very geometric. Uh, so each colored note is mixed individually, perceived individually, and placed individually. Are you and saying that Tommy, who Tommy is? This is Tommy Thurmond. He's uh, someone who studied with Henshi and um, very disciplined painter. But he's not important. No, what? No, he is important. No, 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 wait, yeah, I'm probably- Oh, oh you mean, oh, uh, you as mean- As a subject of this painting, it's light and color that's important. Yes, uh, it's um, light and color was, I really, because I was painting with him at the time and then he posed and I thought in order to honor him, I painted it rigidly according to the process that he had shown me. And oh, so okay. where it's all knife, all facets, every color mixed um, very specifically and- um, I mean, I don't want to go into the process. It's actually yeah. a little bit convoluted. Hard without the yeah. materials in front it's of easy to It's easy to get, to get in the weeds with talking technical talk. But, um, but I love this painting because it really represents an era. For me, it's a diary of my time there. Like, um, and the rigid discipline that I experienced painting with him is ultimately what freed me because I realized that you could really do anything. Like if you can start as crazy as you start when you paint with such rigid discipline, you can kind of recover from anything. And it really made me feel like, I mean, I'm just gonna try everything I can think of to get the magic of the world that I see around me. And, um, but this is a, a good example of color painting in that there's very little that's very, very dark and all of the colors are kept up so that yeah. you can name almost every color that's there. Even the neutrals have a color tint to them oh, yeah. so that yeah. you could say green or that you could say yellow, you know? And now in my current work, I am uh, a lot more free to allow my darks to go all the way down into a blackishness which, and this is where seeing work in person is helpful. They are colors, but they're as dark as they can get. So all of the darks are very intentionally in a color spectrum of either purple or yellow. You know, the whole spectrum, I made sure on my palette that I have 
a dark representative of every key color. And then, so I'm trying to use, really use the full range. And I remember that, wasn't it Sargent who like, didn't get to be an, a considered an impressionist because he was using black. And, yes. um, yes. and I have black on my palette, but I just decided, um, I mean, it's just another color. Like it's, as soon as you paint something that's black, you immediately see that black in the light and black in the shade are two completely different colors and they're brown blacks and green And blacks. by the way, for all, of, for all of our listeners, that business of that, you couldn't be called an impressionist if you painted it in black is absolute nonsense. You think about Ooh. all the black that Degas and Pizarro. Yes, well, there. Degas for sure. He's yeah, plenty of but black. Pizarro too. You should look at a lot of the boulevard paintings of Paris. Uh, they're, they're full of black. But anyway, yeah. um, let's stick with the figure and uh, look at uh, uh, Roman, because that's, I don't know whether you intended this when you uh, selected the images, but this is such a strong counterpoint in my mind to the images, uh, image of um, Tommy. So mm -hmm. this is your child, right? That's right. That's and my youngest. Are you painting him because he's a convenient, accessible subject in this image, or is there some other reason? Well, he decided? requests he requested it, and so um, my kids keep careful track of how many paintings each of them has, oh, and um, and so <laughs> <laughs> so the score needed to get evened up, and he loved this little blue stuffed animal, and wanted to pose with it because it was his friend, and um, and I you know, I mean you can't resist it as a mom, and it's sure. such a perfect window into that era of our life as a family, but also that age of a child where their stuffed animals are real friends to them. Sure. And sure. it has a lot of meaning to them that he wanted. And I have this concept of bearing witness when I do, um, when I do portrait work. And in this case, it was considered a portrait in my mind. So I'm trying to bear witness to who he was at that moment. And this was the corner of my studio. So you see one of my plaster um, sculptures is there. There's, you know, papers on the wall. That's the, you know, window to the side and the uh, chair from well, my grandmother. Abigail, I think having these two portrait images in sequence here is a wonderful thing because uh, I immediately, when I saw this and some of the images on your website of your children, I uh, saw so much more emotion and so much more personality and felt, even though I, at that point when I was looking on your website, I wasn't certain they were your children, uh, that there was a personal connection. Whereas yeah. Tommy is a painting. It's about painting that yeah. I never felt when I saw that, uh, even when we were just looking and talking about it, that that was about a person. Mm -hmm. So I will always love Tommy, but, um, but not yeah, exactly but the same way I love my children. <laughs> we're, we're painting what the surface of Tommy was. And yes. this is, has all of that kind of emotional depth and resonance. That's right. Uh, Here is where I was really bringing in, you know, all of all of my interests at that moment, you know, in the optics of light, you know, and how the light flowed around and behind things and the, you know, Roman himself and uh, the meaning of everything and uh, that sort of direct gaze that kids have where they, you know, They'll just stare right into yeah. your soul. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we are uh, really pushing the time. And so let's look at the last image. And I'm sorry, we're not going to spend more time with the other two uh, still lives. But this one is so striking. Uh, I, I'm glad you put it last. And I really want to talk about that before we get to the uh, mm -hmm. barn wall uh, and talk for a moment or two about landscapes. Let's go back to the lemon. OK, a lemon. Yeah, sitting there uh, in isolation mm. is both to me extremely traditional, thinking not just of the uh, Dutch 17th century still life uh, masters, but our own American tradition and especially the Peel family. Um, and I just read that uh, the Hammond Harwood House acquired a painting, a still life painting by one of the Peel women mm. uh, artists. So what is this painting really about to you? What were you trying to um, share with your audience in this painting? Well, this painting was, um, I did this when my kids were very small. And so I had to hire a babysitter to come and be with them in the house so that I could 
execute a painting. It was a, you know, a time of high need. And so I would often just hire people to come and be in the house to entertain the kids and um, so that I could paint. And so I had a limited window of time. That's why it's small. And I had things I had been thinking about that I wanted to try. I wanted to try painting with the rigid color discipline of doing color facets and uh, very clean mixtures of paint. But I also wanted to push and uh, allow for a full value range. And I wanted to make the shapes that I made, not only shapes that I observed to render the form, because really you look at shapes and you get to choose you know, the shapes. You, you can see lots of different versions of shapes as you're picking and choosing. And so I was really looking to find sweeping rhythms that would make the environment equally important to the orange. Mm -hmm. And so um, there is a thing called scripting where you have, and when I think of scripting, a lot of times it's just gestural breaststrokes that are meant to, you know, activate the surface. And I was looking for, there's an S-curve rhythm that goes up from the top of the painting where the background is dark to lighter that then merges with the, um, the you know, the shadow on the lemon mm -hmm. and then re-emerges back out as the lemon reflects down. And so I saw the rhythm, enhanced the rhythm, similar to the way that I might see a color relationship and I might key it up or down or saturate or desaturate something in order to um, catch the experience that I'm looking for. And so I was, you know, at a point of high focus, it's knife and brush. And it was, I mean, this was a real forecast of the painter that I was going to become. This is back in 2012. And so it was uh, such a successful experiment in, in layering all of that thinking together. Um, that, you know, it, this was really the pivot for me into uh, layering those thoughts more intentionally into my work. Well, this is to me a painting that um, I think the color, of course, uh, is one thing uh, that's quite uh, striking, but it's so much about the act of painting, the mm -hmm. way that I look at it, uh, that I think it's fascinating. I could just sort of sit and look at it for a while, even though it's such a simple, uh, composition and uh, simple image and structure. And now yeah. I'm going to do something that I've never done to one of my guests before. Uh -huh. I apologize. And that is you paint lots and lots of wonderful landscapes. And we only have one uh, okay. to look at. It's the next slide. Uh, and I'm going to ask that we cut out any extended discussion. It's almost like I would like to have you back at another time where we could just talk for a while about your landscapes. Yeah, I know there's a lot there's so, different things to unpack in each of the different subjects. Right. So if you want to take just a few minutes and you tell us all what you think is uh, valuable to you, significant to you about this image, and then we'll start the Q&A. Okay, so this is my family's farm in Minnesota where my, um, you know, I, where I studied painting with my grandmother. And this is, it's a big red barn, a big hip roof red barn. And this is the back wall. The barn is now starting to fall apart. And um, so the back wall is really warped and distorted. And which is instantly, of course, fascinating to me as a painter mm -hmm. uh, and as someone who's not on the hook to fix it. Um, so I loved the, the ripple effect and the distortion of the traditional sort of architectural rigidity that you experience when you try to do perspective drawing on architectural things. But it's emotional because I love that barn. And the farm, you know, might not be able to stay in the family permanently. And I perceived the, um, that white molding um, that's on the side to have like a feeling of like a bone. And so mm -hmm. it's like the strong bones, you know, of the family that are still holding it in place, even as some things, you know, warp and distort, the bones are still there, you know, holding on. Yeah. Um, and it's almost centered, it's not quite centered. Um, and then of course I'm bringing all of my 
technical um, color optics and, you know, feelings of space. But um, for me, it's a story of a family farm, you know, and the symbolic building, you know. And Was revealing the corner of the foundation as you did also significant. Yeah, the because the foundation of the barn is starting to crumble. And so um, it's, you know, it's, it's an old fashioned barn and uh, it's, you know, right out there in the weather. So I, I really was interested in the strong lines of it and, you know, it's personal meaning to me and how even in its crumbling state, it, um, you know, well, it's I have to say, so Abigail, beautiful and such an anchor point. To me, there was something vaguely in my uh, head, and I didn't have a prolonged time, of course, to uh, study this or to talk with you in advance about this particular image. It was um, sort of the way I would say my initial reaction was the center will not hold. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what you've described in a sense, uh, I think. I, I don't think that what I'm saying is completely disengaged from what you were just talking about, it's personal meaning to you. Um, and just one last question before we take the first questions from the uh, audience. Do you try to think of all your landscapes in that way? I mean, this obviously has a deeply personal mm -hmm. and very significant meaning, but is that to some degree typical of most of your landscapes? I would say certainly all of my landscapes have uh, an inner narrative that I bring to them, but uh, some are more personal than others. I am very specifically interested in uh, things being obscured and then revealed. And so having things block your view so that you're seeing around or through something, I feel like there's something about that that incites a longing and makes the things that you can't quite see more attractive, almost like a voyeuristic, like, you know, walking and then your neighbors, you can see into their living room and it's like, whoa, yeah. you know, it's so much more interesting than when you just walk into their living room. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm looking for those concepts uh, and the flow of the line of sight um, in all of my work, I'm interested in looking through. Well, it's been fascinating for me to talk to you and to look at your art uh, in more depth. And now we do have, wow, we have 17 minutes <laughs> for, for Q&A. That might be a, a personal record for me. So uh, who's got questions? I think uh, you had a lot of very interesting, intriguing things to say. So I hope there's lots of good questions. Looks like Jim Earl has something to say. Uh, Martha? Uh, this is not exactly a question. It's more of a statement. But uh, I go way back with Abigail. I met her on Cape Cod when I was doing a, a watercolor workshop with Lee Boyton. And uh, I think that had to be in the uh, la last century, but uh, she at that time was a, a teenager. And as time went on, I've seen her on television, public television, Outdoors Maryland with uh, uh, John Ebersberger. And very recently, I frequently dropped into Abigail's portrait class, which uh, my wife Sylvia uh, was uh, attending. And uh, I saw Abigail in action there. So I'm uh, not at all surprised at how well she has developed but I'm very happy to see that it, it has happened. Well, that's, the, that's very nice of you to share that with us all, James, uh, Jim. Uh, so anybody else? Uh, I, I, I saw one question pop up in the chat. If yes, nobody... um, I can read that off. We have a question from Carolyn Norton who asked, can you talk more about the use of color in barn wall? Mm. Um, can I, can we, 
pull it up so I can see <laughs> while I'm talking about it. I uh, okay. So, well, when you say the use of color, I'm not sure if you mean the process that I used for it, but I would say that um, you know when I'm looking at color, I I break it down into big masses of relationship, and so you can see the shadow in the facing you and the shadow of facing away from you and then the wall facing you in the light and the wall facing away from you in the light. And so if you just look at those four things and you can see that there is a color direction, like a warmer direction to the wall facing and a cooler to um, the wall away in the light. And then when you move up into the shadows, they also have a cool and warm direction. And so when I'm painting in color, I paint, I prism out the color and I paint it by ingredient. And then I push the color into its different directions until they all harmonize with each other. So the color of the sky is influencing the color of the red on the barn. And the, uh, the grass that I'm standing on is influencing the warmth into the, um, the red that's facing me. And so, and then of course it's amazing to go up the white molding. White is amazing for getting to see color. So you can see how, you know, lit it was and how as the white molding goes up into shelter more and more, it adjusts. It doesn't get as much sky and it gets darker and darker as it moves up and possibly more muted. And so, um, I mean, that's really how I think about color. I just try to perceive it as simply as I can and then see everything as a whole and nudge each piece gradually until it sings. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> well, Carolyn appreciated your answer. She says yeah, perfect good. answer. Good. Um, Anyone else? We do have in the chat a lovely comment from Debbie Larcher, um, who says that they would be very much in favor of another will talk with you, Abigail. Oh, <laughs> maybe we'll have to have you back. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I really didn't give a lot of my landscape paintings. I've been focused on still life lately, but I really ebb and flow between still life figure and landscape. The still life has really become where I do a lot of my experimenting. And then I'm trying to push those things out into the landscape and uh, figure. Once upon a time though, all of my experimenting was happening in the figure and then that would get pushed to still life in landscape. So they all feed on each other. It's like cross training. Yeah. Well, uh, Martha, let's put that idea on the back burner as long as I, I'm assuming that Abigail would like to uh, do I would that. Be honored. I, would love I to think do we that. could make another interesting talk just with her landscape. So um, let's pursue that in the future. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. I love talking about art. <laughs> These concepts are so amazing and it's an exciting opportunity to get to talk to an art historian to get your more unique perspective because, you know, I take it upon myself to try to consider my role, but of course I can't be objective and it's the art historians and the, the curators who take on that role of, um, you know, describing and showing people how an individual artist's work fits well, into- Well, I didn't even art. get to people like Winslow Homer and Robert Henry at the Hudson River School. So yeah, we, there's a lot oh, more yeah. to talk about. Well, and he, when you were talking about Chase and saying how he's not, it, it is true that Chase like, doesn't always look like an impressionist. You no, know, his work- because he's, he's not really no. an impressionist. He is a painter of light yes. more than uh, fitting into that category. That was- like so many things in the history of art, uh, an art historian and even an art critic, uh, a, a curator or a gallerist is trying to fit each artist into some kind of known and understood category, yeah. uh, even in you know, the most avant-garde art. That's right. You, know, you make a reference, you know, 
And it's like, that because I studied at that Cape school, which is a real legacy of American uh, impressionism, it's easy to use the label impressionist, but I don't always think of myself as an impressionist painter. I think of myself as a naturalist and, or maybe like an optical humanist, or I just think that uh, impressionism is so well known as, you know, uh, loose brush strokes and high saturation color that people immediately have under, an understanding of what you mean in a certain way when you say that word. But there is a whole generation of painters right now who maybe have sprung from the root of Impressionism, but are doing, thinking very different thoughts and having different priorities the, to what the Impressionists were doing. Well, I then. agree with everything you've said, but I would remind everybody listening that the first Impressionist exhibition they did not call themselves Impressionists. Yeah. That was a derogatory term applied by a Parisian art critic. They considered themselves a diverse group of independent artists. Yeah. Independent was the key word to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of them did, in that exhibition, that first exhibit, painted nothing like Monet. Yeah. They, they, they weren't at all like what the public uh, perception of Impressionism is, including Degas. Yeah. Uh, so, if there aren't any other questions in the chat or from those of you that are in attendance uh, and want to raise your hand or something, then, oh, Martha, do you have a question? I, I don't have a question. I have a comment kind of that could become a question for you, Abigail. Um, but something that I, I do just like a little bit of like watercolor mm -hmm. um, and I have, it's just for fun. I don't plan on exhibiting anytime soon, um, but I love the way that you have found the language to describe your artwork. And as someone who has to write a lot of, um, like I have to write all the descriptions for all the will talks and the way that like I described you today, it's, it's I've had to really train myself on my own. So it, like, I think this could be a long question and maybe we should save this for your second interview if we have one. <laughs> <laughs> but like, how did you begin to build your vocabulary of being able to describe art, talk about your creative process and how you get to to, and I think it goes both ways of language helps you figure out how you're doing what you're doing and yeah. what you want to do. So how do you get there? Well, or personally, how did you? Well, I mean, in the beginning, all of the language that I had was the language that I was taught, you know, the language of the school, the language of art history. And, you know, I would sometimes read artist statements and sometimes they would be super inspiring. And then other times they would just seem like a gobbledygook of words. And um, so obviously you're gunning for the inspiring part and not the gobbledygook part, but it was, it probably started um, when I had my kids and that was a real turning point for me in terms of just how thoughtful I wanted to be about my work. And I would made an intentional decision that I wanted to move in a more personal direction, trying to go so personal in my interests, not just emotional interests, but even technical interests, but I wasn't exactly sure what they were because I'd spent so much time being a student. And so I ended up going uh, into a hyperdrive period of looking at all of the work that I could and doing some reading about it, but I kind of was trying to figure out my place in the world. And so, um, ended up kind of landing on what the roles are that artists play and coming up with names for that, you know, the prophets, the activists, the healers, the chroniclers, you know, and where does my work sit in the role that it's going to play? And I ended up definitely landing in chronicles and healing and, um, and not so much in terms of being an activist or a prophet, um, but it helped me to focus, you know, myself to think in these very broad terms and then decide for myself where my work fit really, you know, somewhat separate. So there's the science side and then read. I do read a lot of scientific articles on optics, and that has helped to uh, give me a little bit more language for the particular kind of art that I make. But um, the more I think about the whys and the meaning behind what I do, the more language I seem to have to describe it. Because before, the only thing I could say was, well, I use a palette knife, you know, and then I make the <laughs> yeah. color and I put it down as best I can, you know? And it's like, 
that's very technical and very, you know, essential, but it's the why part behind it. Like, why, why am I doing that? You know, is it just because I want to make something pretty or is there something richer? And there's a quote from Rex Picat Cole that uh, really caught my attention, the artistic anatomy of trees, where he said, each artist sees in nature, you know, this or that. And, uh, you know, and men of genius find, you know, a particular thing. And then for generations after artists come and dig at that same hole, you know? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, like yeah. I am digging at the holes of art history. I'm digging at the holes of all of the technical knowledge, you know, and understanding of the world that's come before me. I've dug all these holes and there's more to dig, but what do I see in nature? And then what do I even care to investigate? in a more personal way. Personal in that I'm just intellectually interested and also personal in that it fits into a private narrative. The same way that when a song, when a lyricist gives a really specific personal moment about, you know, and then that, yeah, that was my sweater, you know, and even though it's a micro moment, everyone understands what that argument was about, you know? And like, so I'm looking for those things kind of, pushing through the micro to get back into macro. Does yeah. that make sense? I, I have a book recommendation for you. Oh, really? 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 <laughs> um, but um, I, I just want to plug in also that um, for Will Talks is it, like the, the information, the history that I've gotten out of Will and in discussing mm. all of these different types of art forms with all these different types of artists has gotten me on that path so you know artist discussions like this are really important to describe yeah. your craft and i i've thoroughly enjoyed it and tonight as well so yeah well and that was a very articulate statement abigail i think that uh, was useful in a kind of um, comprehensive and global way but also very revealing about your personal uh thinking and approach to your work so to me it makes an excellent place uh to end particularly considering that my watch says 557 Ooh. Rather remarkable <laughs> that we that could do that. <laughs> um, if I can, real fast, um, our next will talk will be on September 21st, and we'll be talking with photographer and mosaicist Natalie McGuire. Um, mm -hmm. I'd also like to plug the fact that if you've enjoyed tonight, um, will talks get published on our YouTube channel about two weeks after the will talk takes place. Um, so you can subscribe there if you want to watch others of this. Um, you can also, if you're an MFA member, you are welcome to apply um, to be on a Will Talk yourself, or if you'd like to recommend someone for a Will Talk, you can email me at communications at mdfedart.org. And the application to uh, apply to the Will Talks is in the member memo, which you receive every Wednesday. So that's my plug. Thank you. Okay. All right. Abigail, thanks again. That was a wonderful conversation. I very oh, much great. enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks really to all of it. you who were listening in and participating tonight. And thanks, Martha, for your excellent support. So. See you in two weeks, I hope. Night. Thanks, everyone.